Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We're glad that you can join us here, here being aboard the Vision of the Seas, crossing the North Atlantic on our way to Barcelona, Spain, to start our next mission journey overseas. Um, we're, we're blessed that they have, as they have done in the past, given us a conference room to use here that we can do the Bible study. Uh, we're also blessed that it's a fairly calm day. Actually, we were aboard this ship a few years ago and we filmed in the chapel as the ship was going this way and that way and things were sliding around. So it's a little more calm. It's not quite like Paul's journey to Rome, but that's another story. Praise okay. God for that. Thank yes. you, Jesus. We're continuing on. Last week we looked at traditions. Our, mm -hmm. The purpose of this is to look at Jesus, his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And I want to tell you, if you missed last week's, the last program, please go watch it because it truly is important. Yes. It's about the idea that so much of what the, the Jewish people believed then and now does not come from the Word, not come from the Torah. It comes from the, the Talmud, the, the traditions of men. And I am, I am convinced that in the church today, and I'll talk about that a little more, we are led more today by the traditions of men in the church than by the Word of God. Now, having said that, I want to read you a scripture from the Gospel of Luke, all right? Uh, I'm going to read starting from Luke 11, verses 37, and I'll go on to verse 45. But before I do that, Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, that we can, that we can gather, Lord God, that we can use this technology to gather. It's not as good as face-to-face, -face, Lord, but I could say the same thing of you. I love to pray, but I'm looking forward when we do it face-to-face. So, F Father, bless this time, and Lord, watch over him. Help me put a guard on my mouth that I don't say anything that you would not have me say. Lord, our desire is to know you more and to be more and more like you, to be changed into the image of your Son, Christ Jesus. We praise you and thank you, Father, in the precious name of your Son. Amen. Amen. All right. Luke eleven thirty seven. Now when he, Jesus, had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, and we, he went in and reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside you're full of robbery and wickedness. You foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? And down in verse 44 it says, Woe to you, for you are like concealed tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. One of the lawyers said to him in reply, Teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. <laughs> well, so before I go on, I want to remind you of what it says in Psalm 119, verse 165. Those who love thy law shall have great peace, and nothing shall offend them. I, I think, I pray that you will hear things that maybe you've not heard before. Because we need to grow in the knowledge of the Word. And as I said, my observation, and this is an observation from having traveled many, many places in many, many countries and many, many different denominations, my observation is that the church today even that portion that proudly declares itself to be Bible-believing and Spirit-led is guided in its beliefs and behavior more by tradition, the tradition of men, than by the Word of God, just like the Pharisees we are so quick to condemn. Now, at the end of the last program, I had mentioned talking about traditions and how we're led by them. I was talking about Christmas. <laughs> now remember the verse above and remember the verse I just quoted, okay? 119, yep. 65. Many people are shocked that Alice and I don't celebrate Christmas. And we haven't for probably the last 39 years. Now don't turn me off yet here, okay? <laughs> They'll say to us, we thought you were Christian. Mm -hmm. Well, I am, I, right. I pray, a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And... See, the problem is tradition becomes the test of our faith. 
as so often happened, over and over That's with Jesus. Jesus. That's right. See, the Pharisees said they knew, they knew that Jesus was a sinner. I'm going to read a couple of verses from John chapter 9, the account of the man who had been born blind. In 9.16 it says, Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, speaking of Jesus, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. John 9.16 But think about this. Jesus never broke a law from the Word of God. He is the Word of God. That's right. What he, what they perceived he was breaking was their tradition about the Sabbath. You see, the, the, their traditions weren't just commentaries on Scripture. They were additions to them. They fleshed out what they said was missing in Scripture. Well, I know nothing is missing in Scripture. Absolutely. The only thing that might be missing in Scripture is your prayerful approach to them. All right? And you're seeking the Spirit of God. There's nothing missing in the Word of God. And again, a little later... When a man who had been born blind is brought to, basically to a trial before the Pharisees, it says, So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. 924. So here they are, these religious leaders, and, and they're saying that they, they know for a fact that Jesus is a sinner because he was not keeping their traditions. They were testing him according to tradition. Now, as I said, people are often sad, you know, they're, they're shocked because we don't celebrate Christmas. And if you only knew how many of the other traditions we don't keep. But that's another story. Now, that's just like the religious people of Jesus' time were shocked by his outlandish and ungodly behavior. That's what they thought. When this man, the Pharisee that Jesus was dining with, saw that Jesus sat down and ate and didn't wash his hands ceremoniously, he was shocked at the ungodly behavior of Jesus. I don't, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. And that's unusual for me. I mean, to think of Jesus as being ungodly. But that's because they tested him, not by the word, nor by the law, but by the traditions that they had built concerning or adding to the word. Jesus said, speaking of his disciples, of Christians, right? He said, you'll know them by their fruit. That's right. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Not by how they washed their hands or how they dressed. And do you not know that that's, do you not see that in the church today? See, I, like the early church, I don't celebrate Christmas, but I promise you, I celebrate the truth of the fact that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 14. In the fullness of time, it says. It doesn't tell us a date, but it tells us in the fullness of time. Every day, we celebrate that as, as we're instructed to do in the Word. And we also, as instructed in the Word, proclaim His death until He comes, day by day, in a New Testament church. I promise you that if you go in prayerfully, led by the Spirit of God, and start to say, Lord, open my eyes and show me those places where we are doing things that you have never told us to do. Or we're being religious. We're being religious. Yeah. We're not being, you know, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus Christ bringing his disciples together for the first time as a group and training them in righteousness before he sends them out to fulfill the purpose of the church in the world. That's what Paul wrote to Timothy, right? 2 Timothy 3.16. He says, all scripture is God-breathed and it's profitable. One of the things it's profitable for is training in righteousness. Now, new believers, we are righteous. By, that's the very gift of God. But we don't know how to behave. We don't know how to walk. We don't know how to do all of these things. We need to be trained in there. Thus, the Sermon on the Mount. So, we celebrate life. We celebrate birth. We cel I promise you, maybe we don't set aside one day a year to celebrate the quote-unquote birth of Christ. And the only thing I know about that is that's not the day. But that's another story. We celebrate life, new birth, all the time. Every time somebody is born again. You see, it, it says in Luke 15, 
And this is Jesus speaking. He says, in the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Because when one sinner repents, that is new life. There is a new birth. That person has been born again. And how, how well does the church celebrate that? Do we just have them fill out a card and say, okay, now you're, you know, you're part of this congregation? No, where's the celebration? Like the father of the prodigal son. Remember the father of the prodigal yes. son? Yeah. When that son came back, he threw a party. I'll tell you what, he celebrated. That upset his other son. Upset. Uh, okay. The father of the prodigal son. And it's more a story about the, the father than it is about the son. He said, for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Luke 15, 24. If somebody becomes, accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and becomes that new creation in Christ, do we celebrate? I mean, do we throw a party? For, because there is no greater miracle. I've seen incredible healings. I have seen demons cast out. I have seen so many things. But there is nothing greater to see than a sinner who changes his mind, repents, and accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And because you have to be born again to see the kingdom of God, that's what Jesus said. You must be born, you must again, be born again to see the kingdom of God. Yeah. Otherwise you don't. So that's why you would celebrate. They're, they're going to see the kingdom of God. Amen. And you know, think about that. that. That, of course, is from the third chapter of the Gospel of John. And it's Nicodemus, a religious leader, leader. of the Jews, right. who comes to Jesus in the night because he's a little concerned about being seen doing this. And he starts to question Jesus. And Jesus says to him, you must be born again. Yes. Whoa. And, and this man says, what, what does that mean? I'm, I'm, I, I can't go back into my mother. He was shocked. He was shocked at the statement of Jesus yes. Christ. Have we gotten to the place where we're so complacent we stop being shocked at some of the statements of Jesus yes. Christ? Because I promise you, there on that hillside where Jesus sat down to teach his disciples and said to them, you've heard it said, but I say to you, they must have been shocked. shocked. Because they never heard that. Before. They had never heard it, but they had all of their lives been hearing the tradition Traditions. of the elders. And Jesus was challenging them all. Could it be in contrast to the word? He is the word. Tradition is often about comfort. No matter how uncomfortable the tradition is. That's right. Because I promise you, the traditions of men often just put burden upon burden upon burden against people who have been set free from the burden of the law. That's the truth. Thus, you could have this situation where Jesus had to say to the people, you know, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. Because the tradition of men had made it such a burden. Yes. You want to know something? Tell me that's not true today. Absolutely. Look in the Jewish community. It's a burden. I mean, we have dear friends who are very, very conservative, practicing Jews. But observant Jews is the term. And I mean, what they go through to keep the, quote-unquote, keep the Sabbath holy, it's such a burden to them. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Not liberty to do whatever you feel like doing, but liberty to walk in that freedom of Jesus Christ. He said, the first thing he said, it's like in his public ministry, I came to set the captives free. Take them out of bondage. You know what? And, and this was part of the problem, not to get sidetracked here. They were looking for a Messiah who would set them free from the Romans. They weren't prepared for a Messiah who came to set them free from themselves. That's right. And that's what he came from, for, to set us free from ourselves. Abraham. It starts with Abraham, and, and you know the people of God yes. start with, with that. I, I, yes, I can go back to, to, to the garden, I can go back to Noah, but the fact is, Abraham is the father of our faith. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? It says in Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place 
which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Not knowing where he was not going. Not knowing where he was going. I want to first of all talk about the very beginning of that verse. By faith, Abraham obeyed. I'll sidetrack myself in a second, but it's important. You need to understand. We are to be a people of faith. We're to walk by faith and not by sight. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But if I ask people all the time, do you, do you know that you get the blessings of God by faith? And everybody will say yes. That's not quite true because it misses something. Because if you look at Deuteronomy 28, and that's still the word of God, it says that faith comes by obeying him. To obey is better than sacrifice. But you see, faith leads to obedience. It gives us the power to obey. And then the blessings come based on the obedience. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. But he obeyed. How uncomfortable could that be? God tells you to go. And you say, okay, where? No, I'll tell you. Yeah. Go. Just go. Just start walking. This is part of the problem that the people of God had when God delivered them from the bondage of the Pharaoh of Egypt. And, to, and God leads them to the Red Sea. The impassable, impossible burden or uh, border between them and the promise of God. And God says, step out, go. Wait a minute. There's water. There's water there. When Moses started to take a step, that water parted. When you start, when you start to take action based on what God says to you, God removes the obstacles. The obstacles will be taken away, right? You see, the flesh, the old man, the right, the old. Yes. That's the old us, the flesh, likes to know where it's going and what's going to happen when we get there. Isn't that true? Absolutely. Yeah. It's not true at your church service. Okay, well, now. the Holy Spirit tells the new man. I'll show you where to go when you get moving. And I'll tell you what to do when you get there. That's right. That can be uncomfortable. Especially when we're so used to making plans. Making plans. Even though it Leaning says, on our own understanding. when it says that we're not to lean on our own understanding, right? Mm -hmm. How do we, this is how we build traditions because it becomes comfortable. Something happens, we do something and we like it. So we'll do the same thing next week. Mm -hmm. And we'll do so, the same thing the week after. And what happens, it, and, you know, it may have been a move of God. Well, we can't God capture is, that. God is not a man that he should change. Mm -hmm. God is, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. But you want to know something? His he doesn't always do matter. things the same way every time. Mm -hmm. And his ways are not our ways. That's right. Okay? When the Holy Spirit moves, we think that we can just put that in a little box and then take that box every Sunday, every and, yeah. Wednesday, and this is how we're going to do it. Because that's how it worked then. But God doesn't work that way. God doesn't work that way. And by the way, God is an everyday God. Yes, He is. Okay? And part of the tradition of man is that we have set aside days that we'll give to God. I don't know what day you will see this, but I promise you that you can say, with all confidence on that day, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. But if this is the day he made, this day is holy. Yes. And this day belongs to him. Okay. Tradition is about comfort. Tradition is about complacency. Mm -hmm. Now remember, uh, last week we talked about this. This whole portion of the study started on the fact that in Zephaniah, in the prophet Zephaniah in the first chapter, God says he's going to search out and find those people who are stagnant in spirit, who are settled on their lees, it says in the King James. And we talked about that's about complacency. Tradition is about complacency. Doing the same thing because we, we like that. We like to know what's going to happen. We like to know what's going to, what's going to do. Now, like I said, our Father, the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, who is not a man that he should change, that's what it says in 1 Samuel 15, yes. and his son, Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever, as it says in Hebrews 13, is all about changing us. Yes. He doesn't change, but all of this, this here and now, is about him changing us. It started with him changing us from being among the walking dead to give, having eternal life. We've been changed 
from the bondage of sin to the freedom of the Spirit. He's been changing us from the turmoil of this world to a peace that passes understanding. God wants to change us, okay? Do you, do you not believe that? This is about change. Right now, each day, every day, God wants to change you. Not just on a Sunday, not just on a Wednesday, not just every single day. It is a process, all right? It's molding and shaping We're us. being changed. We're being transformed. That's change, right? Yeah. Okay. When he says, in, through Paul, I'm going to read the whole thing, Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. It's about being transformed. It's about being changed. And by the way, understand that that is connected to presenting ourselves a holy sacrifice acceptable to God. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Just like I said, right? But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the spirit. 2 Corinthians 3. Now, here's the great promise. And if you don't know this, write it down. This is one that should, that should fill your heart with joy. Paul wrote to the Romans, Romans 8, 29, and he said, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. God's plan. Now, you can look at me, and you can think whatever you want, and you know, I, I am striving for holiness and perfection. I'm striving for it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. But you may have noticed that I haven't achieved it yet. But if you've noticed that, one of the things you should do is be convinced and rejoicing about the fact that I am being changed. I am more like Jesus today than I was yesterday. And that is not a statement of boasting. That is a statement of confidence in the work of the potter on this old clay. What he began, he is able to complete. And he is molding me and shaping me, changing me into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. It is about change. Change is the, is, is the aggressor to tradition. Yes. Tradition is we do it this way, we've always done it that way, and we're comfortable doing it that way. I want to tell you that a number of years ago, uh, while ministering around England, I went into a church. And a church that I had had been to a number of times and had preached in a number of times, and they invited me back. And I went in, and I, by the way, I don't, I don't pre-plan things and I don't go do it to fulfill my purpose. I, I promise you, I do everything in my power to be led by the Spirit of God. So I went in, and this church had a tradition, as many churches do. They had a plan. They would have, you know, the, the music group would come up and do a few songs, and then somebody would come up and do the announcements. They would take up an offering, then they would send the children out for the children's school, and then the pastor or the guest speaker would get up and give a sermon. Well, this particular day, we got there, and services hadn't quite started. And the pastor walked up. He was going to call the music group. And I stood up and I said, it's time for me to minister. I said, it's time for me to speak. And he looked at me and he didn't quite know what to say. He said, okay. So he said, okay. So I got up. Now, none of that has taken place yet, right? I got up and I said, before I start, I'm going to ask everybody in this room this, uh, the, the, that was in their church building. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. I want everybody to stand up and go sit someplace in this building that you've never sat before. And then I said, and I also want you to sit next to somebody that you've never sat next to before. Well, ooh, my, 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 my. He's like, what do we do? What do well, we I mean, do? The, the squirming, the sweating. I mean, now, the thing is. But they did it. They did it. Mm -hmm. And I, 
some people say I'm intimidating at times. I don't think it was because I was intimidating. I think I think there was a presence of the Holy Spirit that was testifying to the truth of what I was saying. So it was an uncomfortable moment, but people did. They got up and they moved around and then they sat down. And I preached about change. I preached about the fact that God brought us into that room that morning for one purpose and one purpose only. I mean, the purpose is to glorify him, but glorify him, the potter, by allowing him to make us change from glory to glory into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. And by the way, the children didn't leave. And by the way, the children were as blessed as the adults. And by the way, I never got invited back to that church. <laughs> Because I, I broke the tradition. There you have it. He was shocked. I think people all through that congregation were shocked at what I, know I had to do. every time he did meet with you after, he said, you'll, oh, have so, to, you'll have to come back. Yeah, yes, and he's always course, very friendly when I meet him, if I meet him on the street or something. But the invitation was not there. But no, I never got invited back. Uh, but you know what? I, this isn't a job for me. No. I, it, it really doesn't matter. And I don't do anything that I do pray God. I don't do it to please men. I do it to please God. And in the church today, we are so resistant to change. And I am here today to tell you that change is coming. I am here to tell you that you have heard it said. You have seen it done. But Jesus says something new is coming. Something new. He's going to change our hearts. He's going to change our attitude. He's going to change our mind. And we are going to walk in the fullness of the Spirit of God, being willing to go, when he says go, without even knowing where he's sending us. To be willing to go without knowing what he's going to call us to do once we get there. Because we are going to walk in faith that leads to obedience, just like Abraham did. I promise you, that at the Sermon on the Mount, there were people there who heard that. Disciples who loved Jesus, who were shocked by what he was saying. Yes. Just like you'd be shocked if I said to you what Jesus said. You've heard it said. No. you got to hate your enemies. An eye for an eye and eye. And he said, but I tell you, love your enemies. How much of that do you see going on in the body of Christ today? That we have to forgive. I'm not going to go through all that. But we're going to go through all that as we get more and more into the Sermon on the Mount. But I want you to know that it was shocking then. And I know that it's still shocking now. But if you have a heart that belongs to God. If you have a desire to be like Jesus Christ. I want you to know you're not like him yet. Not yet. Oh, I, you probably are a lot more than you were yesterday. But you're still not conformed into the image of Jesus. So God the Father is still molding you, shaping you, changing you, that you will be like him once again. That is the great promise, that we will be restored to that place where it was God's purpose in the beginning, made in the image of God. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you are the potter, that you are doing the work in our lives. You are doing the work through our lives, that all we have to do is surrender to you and willingly say, Lord, whatever you want, whatever, Lord, we will do it. We surrender to you. We surrender all. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Well, until next time, God bless you and goodbye. So I cherish that old rugged cross till